six of the Wilderness Issues Lecture Series. Um, before I get started on tonight's topic, I just want to remind folks that next week's lecture is by John Turk, a local author who lives down in the Bitterroot Valley. Um, he's an adventurer, explorer, and scientist. He's written several books, and he's going to be talking to us about his recent uh, explorations in the Canadian Arctic in particular. He was part of a two-man team that did the first circumnavigation of Ellesmere Island in the Canadian High Arctic Archipelago, and so he's going to be talking about his adventures relating to that. And that expedition led him to be chosen, or sorry, nominated for um, one of the 10 adventurers in National Geographic for 2011. So he's going to be next week's speaker. All right, so just to recap, last week, we heard about an entirely human problem, that of marine debris, and how natural cycles of ocean currents, weather patterns, and in some cases, catastrophic events, such as tsunamis, can dictate where the problem may manifest itself, such as remote areas of coastal Alaska that we learned about last week. Uh, but still, the focus of last week was on an entirely human problem regarding our water bodies, as we tie it back into our general theme of water through the semester. Um, hopefully, last week did shed some light on some of the ways that we're beginning to learn to mitigate problems such as an incredibly large issue, um, such as marine debris. So this week's lecture will hopefully give us pause to reflect on the interactions between humans and their environment. So last week we heard about an entirely human problem. This week we're going to change our focus more to the interactions between humans and their environment. And we're not necessarily going to be focusing on one fish species, although um, a lot of what Anders will talk about will have to do with rainbow trout, but rather he's going to also be talking about how a species such as rainbow trout can be used to illustrate society's changing values towards the natural world. For the students in this class who are taking the Wilderness and Civilization program, or those who have taken the program in the past or are thinking about taking the program in the future, Tonight's topic really gets at the heart of what the Wilderness and Civilization Program curriculum focuses on, and that is humans and their environment and how over time we've manipulated the environment in different ways to respond to what we need as society. So how better to address these questions than by using the example, example of a culturally significant and I might say recreationally iconic species such as rainbow trout. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing the story of the rainbow trout, a species that is now found in every state in the United States, every province in Canada, and every continent except Antarctica. Just a couple months ago I was in New Zealand um, in remote river drainages on the South Island looking at rainbow trout and contemplating in my mind, uh, being the biogeographer that I am, as to how this species ended up in New Zealand and, and is so similar to the same species that we fish in Alaska and that I fished growing up in Michigan. So I'm really excited to have the opportunity to bring a speaker to campus that can talk about this topic. Oh, to introduce Anders, Anders Halverson came to us tonight by way of three states. <laughs> he started his day in Colorado, he was in Washington for a bit, then Idaho and now Montana. <laughs> um, Aside from his temporary migrations to far off tributaries, he, his native ground is Colorado. He's an ecologist and author whose book that he will be talking about tonight, An Entirely Synthetic Fish, How Rainbow Trout Beguiled America and Overran the World, uh, recently won the 2010 National Outdoor Book Award. He has a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Yale. And um, he wrote this book as part of one of his projects as a research associate at the University of Colorado's Center of the American West with a grant from the National Science Foundation. I would also like to mention that his book will be for sale tonight after his talk is over, so just come over to this corner and see Willie and I and we can get you set up. Thank you, and with that, let's welcome Anders to our speaker series. Okay, thanks everybody. Is the, uh, you can hear me back there. Is the microphone too loud? You can hear me in the back? Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you Natalie for the introduction and for getting me out here. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. 
So I am going to talk about this book. And before I get going on the story of the rainbow trout, I'm going to tell you a little background about how I got going on this. So I was working on my PhD at Yale. It was a lot of molecular work, a lot of DNA sequencing. And uh, while I was sitting there pipetting, I had a lot of time to think about what was going on in the world and how that science was going to get used. And what I noticed over and over again uh, was that so often in environmental debates, um, the debate is framed in terms of the science. You see the science being used to often cherry picked by both sides to justify their position. But all too often it seemed to me that people had arrived at the position, those positions based on some much deeper set of values that were frequently unexamined even by the people themselves. And I decided I wanted to try to get to the bottom of this. This is just some examples of newspaper stories about all the controversies that go on over fish and aquatic resources. But this applies, obviously, much more broadly to uh, any environmental issue and even beyond that, probably. So um, I decided I wanted to try to get to the bottom of that and somehow convinced NSF to give me a grant to write this book. And I decided I wanted to write this book about freshwater fisheries management, which is no stranger to controversy. Um, as all of you in Montana probably know. Um, so how did I end up on freshwater fisheries management? Well, first of all, that's one of the, maybe it's the primary way that people in the United States relate to aquatic ecosystems. There's 30 million fishermen in the United States. Um, a great deal of those are, are freshwater, although some are obviously marine. But that's how um, Americans, in general, relate to aquatic ecosystems. And Second of all, I grew up fishing in Colorado. And uh, I quit fishing at some point when I was in high school or thereabouts. I just stopped picking up the rod. And I never really thought about why until, once again, I was sitting there pipetting away. And it occurred to me that there's a real paradox involved in, in fishing. And, and um, I was a fly fisherman. Like a lot of fishermen, I, I used to view it and still view it as a way of getting away from civilization, getting away from industrialization, a way to sort of get back to the natural world. And yet, if you look at it, fishing is very much a product of our industrialized society. Rainbow trout are a case in point. So this is just some examples. These are the extreme examples that I began digging up as I started doing research on this. This, is the, uh, this was the world record rainbow trout. It's 43 pounds, I think. They caught it up in Lake Diffenbacher in Alberta. Um, the same two brothers, the Conrad brothers, have hence, since gone back and, and found a, caught a bigger one, something like four pounds heavier. Um, so this fish is uh, triploid. So it probably escaped from a fish farm. Uh, uh, triploid meaning it has an extra um, set of chromosomes in it. It's been manipulated, heat shocked probably to create an extra set of chromosomes so that it never sexually matures, and therefore it puts all its energy into growing, growing big like that. So uh, that's probably an escapee from a fish farm. This guy, this is from the University of Missouri, I believe. Um, and they have been feeding their rainbow trout creatine, which is the same bodybuilding supplement that bodybuilders use. That's what Mark McGuire used in the Home Run Derby way back when. Um, and, and they say in the press release for this, I haven't actually talked to the folks that are doing it, but they say in the press release, literally it's because they think fishermen will pay a premium for a harder fighting fish. <laughs> and then finally down here is uh, genetically modified rainbow trout. They've knocked out myostatin in that fish, which inhibits protein uh, or muscle growth. So uh, as you can see, this guy has six pack abs waving down here. And in case of any of you don't know, fish are not supposed to have six-pack abs. Um, so this is where these things are heading. Here's one more example that I dug up from 1996. In Idaho, they were finding that the fish, the trout they were releasing, the rainbow trout they were putting out in the streams, nobody was catching them because the fish were so used to eating pellets in the hatcheries that they didn't know they were supposed to eat that worm that was dangling in front of them on the hook. So they had to actually train them for a few weeks to eat worms before they released them, just so that they would know what their job was when they got out there. OK, so those are some of the more extreme examples. Um, but actually, if you look at it, OK, so first of all, why rainbow trout? I said I got started on freshwater fisheries management. Rainbow trout are far and away the most heavily stocked fish in the United States uh, by weight. 
So we stock about 25 million pounds of rainbow trout into our fresh waters every year. That's 100 million fish, so they're all catchables these days, which we'll get into a little later. Um, we actually, by number, we stock more walleye, uh, but we stock them at a very small size because they're very difficult to raise in hatcheries. So by the amount of effort that we put into fish, rainbow trout are absolutely king. I mean, they dwarf the others, the browns and the brookies and the catfish. Um, and it was actually very difficult to get those numbers, interestingly. Nobody uh, had, had gathered and aggregated the data for what we stock into fresh waters in the United States for the last 35 years or something. So I had to go to every state and try to dig this up and add it all up to get there. Okay, so as you may know or may not know, um, rainbow trout are not native to Montana except for a tiny little corner of the state. They're and they're not native to most of the rest of the country or the world either. They're native only to the Pacific Rim from Mexico up around through to Kamchatka. Um, and yet, as Natalie pointed out, they've been introduced to every continent in the world except for Antarctica and every state in the United States, every province in Canada. And these are, there are famous fisheries, as many of you probably know, in New Zealand and uh, South Africa, Argentina, Chile, Europe um, cultures a lot of rainbow trout. So they've, they've really taken over the world, as it says in the subtitle of the book. And they're not just there physically. They've become a, a cultural phenomenon. So these are some postage stamps. This one is from um, South Africa, Malawi, Oman, New Zealand. They were our state fish in Colorado up until 1994, um, despite the fact that they're not native to Colorado. They were the state fish in Utah until 1997. Again, they're not native to Utah. Rainbow trout are, are iconic. They're the, icon they're the iconic fish, the iconic trout, the world over. Um, and especially in the United States, as I'm sure many of you know, you drive into any town, you can see rainbow trout signs hanging around. You can, uh, you can get rainbow trout oven mitts, rainbow trout staplers. Um, so they've become this iconic species. And so I wanted to get to the bottom. So how did, how did we get here? How did we get to this, this iconic status? OK, so the story goes back all the way to the 19th century, the latter decades of the 19th century. Um, and the United States was undergoing an industrial revolution that for the purposes of this story had two big effects. First of all, it um, created massive wealth and uh, urbanization and also massive wealth for a small segment of society, the Anglo-Saxons who were running the country in the East Coast. And these Anglo-Saxons who were running the country in the East Coast watched their kids coming. They weren't, they weren't outside anymore. They weren't out hunting. They weren't out fishing. They weren't out farming. They were inside in offices all day long. This guy, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., was, he's the father of the famous Supreme Court Justice, and he was a famous man of, in, in his own right at the time. He was a magazine columnist. And I'm going to read you a quote that he wrote in one uh, magazine that actually always gives me, makes me feel much better because I have kids and I worry about this today. And it is, such a set of black-coated, stiff-jointed, soft-muscled, paste-complexioned youth as we can boast in our Atlantic cities, never before sprang from the loins of Anglo-Saxon lineage. <laughs> so you read about these things like Richard Louv's book about nature deficit disorder and last child in the woods and things. They were worrying about the same things 150 years ago. Um, and uh, the, 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 the solution to this was to get these kids outside again and specifically to get them out fishing or hunting. They decided hunting was impossible because the large mammals had been absolutely decimated beyond repair. But fishing, that was another matter. And that's where we get to this fellow here, George Perkins Marsh, who is considered by many to be the father of the environmental movement in the United States. He was a fascinating guy. He, uh, he wrote a biography of the camel. He wrote the first Icelandic English dictionary. He was a member of Congress. He was Lincoln's ambassador to Rome. And he wrote a book for the state of Vermont about what they should, uh, not a book, a report about what they should do about their fisheries problem. Because just like everywhere else on the East Coast, fisheries 
had been absolutely wiped out by this industrial revolution. They had da new dams going in all the time. They had intensive agriculture setting up, sending all this sediment into the stream, intensive logging. Uh, the factories were using these rivers as uh, unregulated sewers. Um, and so he writes this report. And just to show you that I, that, that I wasn't just uh, cherry picking Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr.'s quote, here's his quote from an 1857 report that he wrote for the state of Vermont. He wrote, this is about fisheries, remember, but he chose to editorialize. We have become not merely a more thoughtful and earnest, but it is to be feared a duller as well as a more effeminate and less bold and spirited nation. And he goes on to say that unless we can create some manly men, some virile men, democracy itself in this country is going to be at risk. So how do we go about creating these virile men? We have to get them out fishing again. How can we get them out fishing? How can we, so we have to get the fish back. Interestingly, for someone who is considered the father of the conservation movement in this country, this was an era of laissez-faire capitalism, and he knew it. And he wrote, of course we can't um, regulate industry. We can't stop building dams. We can't do anything to stop the, address the root cause of the problem. But we have a technological fix. Fifteen years ago, they had discovered how to artificially propagate fish in France. And that technology had transferred to the United States. And people had been talking about it. And he says, that's the solution. We artificially propagate fish, put them into the rivers. The boys will go fishing again. They'll be manly again. And democracy itself is going to be safe. <laughs> this takes a hiatus for the Civil War, of course. And then afterwards, this idea comes back with a vengeance, thanks to this guy here, Spencer Fullerton Baird. So Baird was the assistant secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He was a very accomplished and respected naturalist and scientist. And Baird got going on this in about 1871, I believe, 1870, 1871. He says to the... Um, to, to Congress, listen, you need, we need to do an investigation. There's been an enormous decline in the scup, which are a marine fish, off Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And we need to get to the bottom of it. And somehow he convinces Congress to appropriate some funds to create the United, the United States Fish Commission. And he goes out and does this investigation about what's happening with the scup off Massachusetts and Rhode Island and con concludes after his investigation that it's because of all these fish traps that they've got in every estuary and that unless Massachusetts and Rhode Island start removing some of those fish traps, at least uh, periodically, the scup are going to be absolutely wiped out. And he goes to Massachusetts and Rhode Island and he says, unless you do that, the federal government is going to step in and force you to. Well, Massachusetts and Rhode Island laugh at him. They say, you know, the federal government doesn't have probably the constitutional authority and certainly not the political willpower to do something like that. And second of all, the year after he came out with these findings about the cause of the decline of the scup, there was a scup baby boom. The scup were everywhere. And so it looked like whatever conclusions he had drawn based on his science, he was dead wrong. So he's sitting there with this U US Fish Commission wondering what to do. And a group of people come to him, the, um, the fish culturalists of America come to him and say, listen, what we need to do, the American Fish Culturalists Association says, what we need to do is you should start, your agency, your federal agency should take over propagating fish and introducing them into these waters. He says, fine, if you can get an appropriation, um, we'll do it. And so they go to Robert Roosevelt, who is the uncle of um, Teddy Roosevelt, but he was a Congress member himself at the time, and Robert, Ro and also a big sport fisherman, and Robert Roosevelt uh, manages to get funds so that the U.S. Fish Commission can start artificially propagating fish and stocking them into these waterways. They say it's a federal job because so many waterways cross state boundaries and things like that. And within a few years, um, fish culture has taken 75, 80% of the budget of the U.S. Fish Commission is devoted to artificial fish culture, and the budget is growing exponentially. It absolutely takes off. It's been said that it was the first um, really great environmental craze in this country. So this picture I really love. This right here is um, the unfinished Washington Monument. So we're on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. here. This is a horse-drawn cart pulling these uh, milk cans here that have fish 
fry in them. And if you actually look at a map of Washington, D.C., you'll notice that the Washington Monument is off center. It's not on the right, it's not on the correct line between the White House and uh, the Jefferson Memorial. Because right here was a, pond, a big pond, a big uh, lake. It was marshy, and there was a big lake right there, right on the National Mall. And that's where the U.S. Fish Commission got going with its artificial fish propagation. They started raising fish right there on the National Mall. And so this guy's on his way to deliver fish into that pond. This is Central Station, which was a building right on the mall again. And you can see all the egg hatching jars in the background. And what they would do is they would bring fish eggs and fry in from all over the country and then send them out. And um, Baird, in addition to being a great naturalist, was a politically very savvy person. And so he said he would send anybody that wanted them, he would send them fish, any group or any individual to get fish from the United States Fish Commission, but they had to send their request through their member of Congress. And so the Congress was vitally aware of how much their constituents loved the US Fish Commission. And once again, the appropriations kept rolling. So what they would do, if, you, if they got a request, they would send you a telegram a few days ahead of time and say, OK, we're going to be rolling into your station here in our specially designed fish car. And, um, just be there with some milk cans, and we'll pour some of our fish into your milk cans. And then you take them out and introduce them to your stream. So this was going on all over the country. Um, it was actually part of a much bigger movement, interestingly, uh, called the acclimatization movement, which was going on at the time. It, that, that movement got its start with the French and the British, uh, thanks to their empires. And the idea was to try to acclimatize or introduce wild species, wildlife, um, throughout the world. So the, the French were experimenting with zebras and camels, and, and everybody was experimenting with all this different wildlife. In fact, the reason we have starlings today across the United States, they're not native to the United States. The reason they're here, and this is not an apocryphal story, it's a true story. There was a, a captain of industry in New York who had made his money in, in, as, a, as a pharmacist. And he decided that Americans were going to be culturally impoverished if we didn't have every bird listed in Shakespeare. So because starlings were mentioned once in Henry IV in one line, um, he brought some over and introduced them in Central Park. And that's how we have these huge flocks of starlings across the country today. Um, so it was the same idea with the US Fish Commission. They were trying to introduce fish throughout the country um, to see what would take and what wouldn't take. And the idea was, at the time, to create these self-sustaining populations of fish. OK, so while I was working on this book, I became sort of fascinated with it by this guy. This is Livingston Stone. Livingston Stone was a minister in New Hampshire. He had this very secure job uh, in Charlestown, New Hampshire, not too far from Boston. And uh, he traced his lineage back to the Mayflower. His family was a big Boston family. And somehow, what's that? Uh, Charlestown, New Hampshire. Yep. Right on the Connecticut River. Um, somehow, so, so I, I chased him. Wherever he'd been, I went there and tried to, tried to figure him out. Because for some reason, he quit his job as a minister and chucked it all and took up fish culture. And in 1872, only three years after they'd finished the Transcontinental Railroad, he went. So he went to Baird and he said, listen, we need salmon to stock all over the country. Of course, Atlantic salmon had been absolutely wiped out in the east. Relations with Canada were at a low ebb. So he said, let's go to the Pacific. We'll get some Pacific salmon, bring them back, stock them up and down the east coast, and, and problem solved. So 1872, three years after they finished the Transcontinental Railroad, this demure minister from New Hampshire gets on the train with two assistants, crosses the country, um, and lands in Sacramento. And he says, so you know, we're here to collect salmon. And where are the salmon? And everyone says, oh, we haven't had salmon around here for years. Because the hydraulic mining was so intensive in California that it had wiped out the salmon up and down the, in California. At one point, the bed of the Sacramento was going up by six feet per year because so much sediment was being washed into it from the hydraulic mining. Eventually, he finds some railroad engineer who says, oh, you know, I think I've seen Indians spearing um, 
salmon up on the McLeod River, which is way up north. It's a very, very remote area. It's up by Mount Shasta. The railroads haven't even reached up there yet. So uh, Stone gets on the railroad, goes as far as he can, gets on the stagecoach, goes even further. The stagecoach was a dicey proposition. It was apparently robbed once a week. This is actually a staged event, but you can see the guy holding the gun supposedly robbing the stagecoach here. Um, he goes up there to the McLeod, gets off the stagecoach and starts walking, and sure enough, he sees a bunch of salmon drying on the bushes. And it's the Wintu Indians right up there. This is uh, Wintu right there, who inhabited that, that McLeod River. And they were the only ones there. Fortunately, uh, there was no gold really to speak of on the McLeod, so the gold miners hadn't gone in there. And in addition, the Wintu had killed or driven off everybody who had actually tried to settle there. But somehow, Stone convinces them to let him stay. And so he stays there and he sets up his salmon hatchery. And uh, for the next seven years, he's shipping salmon back east on the stagecoach and then the train and whatnot. And they stock these Pacific salmon up and down the east coast. And to this day, there's not a single run of Pacific salmon on the east coast, despite tremendous effort on their part. So what are they going to do? They don't want to lose face. Um, they've got this operation going in California. They hear from another fish culturist in New York, Robert Roosevelt actually, and, and a guy named Seth Green, about this fish called rainbow trout. And Stone says, here's Stone right there, and that's his two assistants, one of them's his nephew. Stone says, you know, I've seen fish like that here in the McLeod, so let's try that out. So the, he, get, he goes and builds a new hatchery for the rainbow trout, and they ship some of those back east, and they're an immediate success. Um, they thrive in the hatcheries. They're a great big hit with the sport fishermen because they're good fighters, as, as many of you probably know. They go airborne, unlike many of the other fish. Um, they can withstand conditions that the eastern brook trout can't stand. And so um, they began sending these rainbow trout to their hatcheries, the U.S. Fish Commission hatcheries, all around the country, raising them there and shipping them out. And within a few years, Rainbow trout have been introduced to 33 of the 38 states that were then in the Union, and it just goes on from there. Um, okay, so um, it absolutely takes off. Rainbow trout gets stocked all over the country. At some point, we switched. I was telling you that now we, we have uh, 25 million pounds of rainbow trout stocked every year, 100 million fish, so we're stocking them now at catchables. So the goal switched from trying to stock them as fry and create these self-sustaining populations to actually trying to stock catchable fish. The idea was this new metric came into vogue, which was return to creel. And the idea is it's economics. We want to maximize or minimize the cost for every fish that gets returned to a fisherman's creel. So they do. They realize that at some point, the most economically sound thing you can do is to stock catchables. These catchables don't live very long, but you stock them, and uh, the fishermen pull them right out of there within a few weeks. And it, and it gets even more sort of insidious. At some point, somebody realized, well, if you just stock them near the bridges, you're going to do better than if you try to stock them up and down the stream. And actually, if you have a siren on your truck, so everyone knows where you stocked them, they'll pull them out of there better. It, it sort of gets, goes on and on like that. And it gets to these real extremes. And just to show you how far it goes, I'm going to flash forward now to 1962. So, which actually is exactly 50 years ago, right? So um, here we are in the, in the Green River in, in uh, Wyoming. So the Green River is really the headwaters of the Colorado River. It's a 15,000 square mile watershed. It's basically the south uh, west quarter of, of Wyoming. And uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, as part of the Colorado River Storage Project, decides to build two dams here, one up here at Fontenelle and one down here in Flaming Gorge. And Wyoming Game and Fish and Utah Fish and Game and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service realize that this is going to fundamentally change the nature of this river. It's going to take what had been a traditional western river full of uh, uh, sediment floods in the, in the spring, to a, a warm little trickle in the late summer and create this beautiful, nice, cold water, consistent um, river out of it. 
And they say, well, this is the opportunity of a lifetime to create a great, of course, rainbow trout fishery. So uh, this is what it looks like today. There's the dam there, Flaming Gorge Dam. That's downstream. This is the reservoir behind it. So um, Wyoming Game and Fish really spearheads this thing. And they get Fish and Wildlife Service to provide the money. They decide they're going to poison this entire watershed so that it will be safe for the rainbow trout that they plan to introduce. So that's a watershed the size of Connecticut and Massachusetts combined. And they want to poison all of the fish out of it so that they, there will be no uh, competition or predation on the rainbow trout that they're going to introduce. The poison they're going to use is called uh, rotenone, which they still use today. Um, Okay, so when I started working on this, I thought, well, this is going to be really this is going to be an easy one. I'll just go to the microfiche and look at the newspapers, and there's got to be huge headlines about this. They're poisoning out a watershed the size of Connecticut and Massachusetts. I couldn't find a single article about this, and so I had to dig even deeper and deeper. And finally, I started finding articles. They were in the sports section, and all of the articles, almost every one of them, just talked about how great the fishing was going to be when we accomplished our task and wiped out all the native fish and non-native fish in this watershed and introduced this non-native rainbow trout. That's, that was the only place that you found any articles about it. It was not controversial, is the point. The only person, or the only, there were very few people, I won't say he's the only one, but one of the only people to object was this guy, Robert Miller, and his father-in-law, Carl Hubbs, who were two ichthyologists who were really some of the first ones to start focusing on sort of non-game species and native fish throughout the West. And Miller got bitterly upset about this. So, so I actually wound up getting access to all of his letters, which are still at the University of Michigan. And you can just see the smoke coming out of his ears because, you know, at one point he's complaining that the, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Game and Fish Department have brainwashed Americans. In fact, this project, they call it the Green River Rehabilitation Project. And they talk about how bad it's, they don't want to have recontamination of the Green River by these native fish. So, so he just, he's bitter about these words that they keep using over and over again about native species. Um, and and, it, and it was, it, that really brought it home to me as well. This was a completely different mentality in 1962. The Fish and Game Departments, the Fish and Wildlife Service send out press releases saying this is what biologists have determined is the best management technique. It's, Rivers are like pastures. You wipe out the species you don't want, and you put in the ones that you do want. Um, and so it really was the mentality back then. There was the, the division was between game fish and trash fish. It was not, today we're so used to thinking in terms of native fish and non-native fish, or native species and non-native species. That wasn't on anyone's radar screen. It was game fish and trash fish. Rainbow trout were game fish. The right thing to do is to get them in there. Okay, he tries his hardest to get newspapers and magazines to get on board and try to oppose this project. Gets absolutely nowhere. He can't get the Sierra Club interested. He can't get um, uh, the Ecological Society of America interested. He can't get, even me, most academics are scared to even sign up or even express support for what he's saying because the Fish and Wildlife Service explicitly, I've, I've seen letters, threatens to cut off funding to their department if they oppose this project. So he gets no traction whatsoever. And the project goes forward as planned. So um, what they did is they set a dozen, uh, dozen uh, I think it's about 20 something, uh, drip lines across the river every 10 miles. So you can't really see the drip line here. But the rotenone, when it hits the water, turns the water a milky white color. So you can see the drips. You can figure out where the drip line is. That's rotenone dripping into the stream. And what they would do is they would wait until, so they started the, the top, the, uh, the drip line that was the furthest upstream. They would start the rotenone flowing. As soon as that rotenone front hits your drip line, you turn yours on. So there's this uniform front of rotenone flowing downstream. And the people who were there described just thousands and thousands of fish thrashing and trying to get out of the way in front of this front of rotenone moving downstream. And they're all just getting pushed downstream. Um, this operation goes on for three days. Um, interestingly, this, this picture is interesting too. So they invited all of the, re the nearby residents, anybody, 
to come out and actually pick up the dead fish. From, this is all rotten on water here. Pick up the dead fish and bring them home for dinner. So this guy's out here picking up some trout to bring home for dinner, some rotenone trout. And that's particularly interesting because today we use rotenone in lab mice and rats to induce Parkinson's disease symptoms. So we can study Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's, uh, it's sort of, <laughs> anyway, you get the point. OK. So originally, uh, Game and Fish, Wyoming Game and Fish, or the, the agencies had been planning to do the Rotenone project the moment that Bureau of Reclamation closed the gates on the Flaming Gorge Dam. And so they reasoned that the Rotenone would build up behind the dam and naturally detox, oxidize and detoxify. And they were going to do it in September. Then they got word from Bureau Rec that they were not going to close the gates until November, at which point the water would be too cold for the Rotenone to be effective. So the agency, these fish fisheries agencies decide they have to go ahead with this project anyway, and they have to go with plan B, which is to actually um, oxidize the rotenone by dumping potassium permanganate on it. Um, so, okay, so first of all, this project, these pro this wasn't the first time this projects like this had been done. They'd been doing it for the last 10 years um, in rivers from California, I think, started it off, of course, with the Eel River and the Russian River. And uh, other states had tried it, but none had been nearly as ambitious as this. This is far and away the most ambitious project ever done. So they go downstream and they find this bridge in Browns Park in Colorado. And they decide, OK, they set up these spreaders to uh, dump potassium permanganate off this bridge. So when the rotenone hit front hits the bridge, they dump the potassium permanganate. The rotenone is detoxified and everybody's happy, right? Except, of course. Um, a cold, uh, any number of things go wrong. First of all, a cold front comes through so that there's whipping wind and bitter cold and snow all over the place. The um, best way that they have to uh, tell how much rotenone is getting downstream, how toxic the water is, is these sentinel cages that they have just down here. So, you, so uh, they put live fish in these sentinel cages and watch them to see if they're in distress. And if they are, they radio up to the bridge and say, more potassium permanganate, more potassium permanganate. Well, you can imagine doing that in the, middle of, in the middle of the night, whipping wind, snowstorm going all around. On top of that, for some reason, the rotenone is far more concentrated than they expected, so they don't have enough potassium permanganate to neutralize it. So they send these trucks out scouring the countryside for potassium permanganate. The spreaders aren't suited for the particular size of the granules of potassium permanganate, so they, they're having a hard time getting the spreaders to work to send this stuff. Anyway. A lot of rotenone gets downstream, or some rot. I won't say a lot. Some rotenone gets downstream. And guess what? 16 miles downstream from here is Dinosaur National Monument. And Dinosaur National Monument has become sacred ground to Americans because of the sort of brilliant PR campaign that the Sierra Club, David Brower, those guys had done only about five years earlier, or a few years earlier. Bureau of Reclamation had wanted to build a dam in Dinosaur National Monument. And Brower and those guys took out full page ads in the New York Times and convinced America that our national parks were our cathedrals, that they were our national heritage, and that they were sacrosanct. And in particular, the sacred ground was Dinosaur National Monument. That's what they fought the battle over. Um, so you have uh, a sacred, sacred ground here. And second of all, Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring almost to the day when this event goes on. And I don't think everyone realizes it today, or a lot of people don't realize it, but that was electrified the nation, that book. That was, again, this is the 50th anniversary from that book coming out. That book absolutely electrified the nation and convinced Americans that there was something fundamentally wrong with the way that we were going about spreading all of these insecticides and chemicals all over the, the environment, trying to transform it for our purposes. And so you have this one-two punch. You have, all of a sudden, uh, nasty chemicals being spread into our sacred national park. And all of a sudden, finally, Miller gets his way in a controversy, actually does break out. Um, now, uh, they did find, of course, these are some dead fish that they found in Dinosaur National Monument. Whether or not, there's, it, there's, it, it seems likely that, um, certainly, there were plenty of fish who stayed alive in Dinosaur National Monument. And there's a controversy to this day about whether that rotenone actually killed the fish in the monument 
or whether these were just dead fish from upstream that got washed down to the monument. Either way, it completely ceased to matter. It becomes a moot point because of the controversy and the politics that get kicked up around it. Stuart Udall, who is the you know, relatively new um, Secretary of Interior under Kennedy, of course has the Park Service under his purview and Fish and Wildlife Service who funded this operation. And they're going at it and he's getting letters from Congress saying, what are you, what, were you really, do you really think you're doing what, uh, you're, 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 you're following your duties? And he uh, decides to commission this, this report on the event. And in addition, and in which he writes, from now on, uh, anytime there's a threat to a unique species, that has to be foremost in our, in our consideration about whether the project should go forward. And he establishes, about six months later, the Committee on Rare and Endangered Wildlife Species. And that committee, it's, it's one of the first times um, anyone has started compiling a list of endangered species in the United States. It leads directly, there were, there were in fact two iterations of the Endangered Species Act prior to the 1973 Endangered Species Act that we all think of today. That leads directly to the 1966 iteration of it, the 1969 iteration of it, and the 1970, therefore the 1973 Endangered Species Act. So, and in, here's another interesting bit of trivia. He puts in charge of the Committee on, on Rare and Endangered Wildlife Species the guy who was also in charge of the poisoning of the Green River in Wyoming. But nevertheless, he seems to have done a good job. They get Miller to start making the lists of the, the endangered species. Um, and we've now spent more than $100 million under the Endangered Species Act trying to restore some of the same fish we were trying to poison out of the Green River um, in 1962. So that just shows you how things go in circles. Um, OK. Oops. OK. Um, so this is the Sierra Nevada. I'm going to move on to the present day now and talk about some of the management conundrums that we face um, based on all this history. So this is a lake up in the Sierras, just heart-stoppingly beautiful. And, and uh, you all have beautiful mountains here, I know. But the Sierras are unbelievable. This, that, that granite is so light. John Muir called them the range of light. And if you have a chance to get up there, I recommend it. Um, Anyway, there's about 10,000 lakes up there, let's say, scattered around in the high country. And almost none of them have any native fish because after the glaciers retreated, the barriers were, were insurmountable for these fish, the waterfalls. They just couldn't get up to these lakes. So a whole fauna evolves up here over the last 10,000 years that's completely naive to, to fish. Um, and then about 100 years ago, people start saying, well, here, this, what a waste. Here's all these lakes, and there's no fish in them. We've got to get them up there. And in fact, John Muir strongly, John Muir went and visited um, Livingston Stone and his hatchery down there around Shasta and became a proponent of stocking the Sierra Nevada with fish. So the miners, the Sierra Club, John Muir, they started bringing fish up on, in uh, backpacks or on horse packs and dropping them into these lakes. But they didn't really get very far because there's only so much you can do with uh, one backpack and 10,000 lakes. Then, after World War II, it really takes off. So this guy here, right, uh, third from the left, is a guy named Carol Faist. He was a bomber pilot in the Pacific. And uh, I talked to him for quite a while about this, and he told me some great stories. So basically, after World War II, we had a lot of surplus military aircraft. And we had a lot of demobilized pilots coming home. And remember, this was the can-do generation. And they said, they looked at what people were doing to stock these lakes with backpacks or horse packing. And they said, oh, come on, we can do better than that. So Carol and his uh, friend Al Reese, the other pilot with California Fish and Game, decided to do some experimenting with stocking fish from the air. And the first experiment they do, they take up one of these milk cans full of fish, and they fly up in their plane and just chuck it, milk can and all, out the window, <laughs> trying to hit a hatchery pond down below, and they miss. And the milk can goes smashing along the rocks and comes to a stop. And they go and land and run over to the milk can, and they find 16 fish still alive in the milk can. And they say, oh, shoot, if they can survive that, they can survive anything. But they, they do a few more experiments. They, um, they hold some. They hold fish up in their. You know, they would take them out of the milk can, hold them up in their hands while they gunned the truck down the hatchery driveway, 
and then pop them back in after a couple minutes just to see, see if the fish can survive flying on their own. And of course they can. And so these guys cut a hole in the bottom of the plane and start um, dumping fish out of the plane without the milk can, and it's a huge success. Um, before long, almost 95% of those lakes up in the Sierras that can hold fish now have fish in them that were stocked out of one of these planes. <coughs> and incidentally, I like to point out that it wasn't just fish that these guys were experimenting with. They, um, they did turkeys, they did pheasants, and, and best of all, they did beaver. <laughs> so so they, they, uh, they tried it all. Um, okay, so you get to the present day, and uh, this is about 2000 or so. This guy, Roland Knapp, who works for the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab. There's, this is actually the controversy that got me really interested in this topic. So um, I'm going to skip ahead for a minute. There, were, there was all this controversy about what was going on because um, Knapp convinced them that they should allow him to go try removing some of these fish from one of these lakes. Um, and see what happens because there's the mountain yellow-legged frog, which used to be ubiquitous up there, has been on a steady and now even more precipitous decline to the point that it looks like it'll get listed at some point under the Endangered Species Act. And so Knapp says, look, let's see if we, if we maybe it's the fish. And so, and so everyone says, oh, that's, that's silly, but go ahead and give it a try. He can't use rotenone uh, because California is very sensitive about the use of chemicals in the environment, especially rotenone. So he has to gill net these things. So he sticks these gill nets out in these lakes. And it takes about three years to be sure that you've completely removed all of the fish from these lakes. But once you do so, sure enough, these mountain yellow-legged frogs made a big comeback. So all of a sudden, fish and game, California fish and game stops stocking almost cold turkey and totally reevaluates the program. And these lakes, you know, they had thousands of lakes that they'd been stocking every lake every other year. Now they only stock a few hundred every year. The rest of them, they let it be. And this has been wildly controversial with, as you can imagine, uh, some of the communities down below like Bridgeport that depend on fishing for a lot of their economy. Um, and this is the one that really um, interested me and, and, and made me say, okay, people are cherry picking the science because Sure enough, all of the fishermen in Bridgeport are 100% convinced that the reason the mountain yellow-legged frog is declining is because of the pesticide drift from the Central Valley. And all of the ag workers in the Central Valley, the farm owners at least in the Central Valley, have all the science in the world to say, oh no, it's from the fish stocking. That's what's causing it. And they both have the science and they'll both pull out the reports and show them to you to prove to you that they're the ones that are right. Um, anyway, Fish and Game, which had been stocking these lakes, now, in fact, is hiring. This is a fish and game uh, seasonal employee. They are now the one, fish and game is now trying to gill net out some of the same trout that they were stocking in only about five or 10 years earlier. So once again, the world goes in, in circles. Um, and finally, I'll get here to Montana. Um, so that's the North Fork of the Flathead right there. Somehow I convinced my wife when I was writing this book that I needed to go up there and go fishing for research purposes, and she was a little suspicious. But anyway, okay, so West Slope, so one of the other big problems with rainbow trout is that they hybridize with the native cutthroat from the Rocky Mountain West. They're very closely related, and <clears throat> we've introduced, again, rainbow trout throughout the Rocky Mountain West, and because they hybridize with the cutthroats, they create these mongrels, this mongrel swarms. And uh, the West Slope cutthroat used to be one of the most widespread subspecies of cutthroat in the West. But depending on who you ask, they're down to 2% or 20% of their native range. And it raises some really fascinating uh, issues. So here's a map from a group, uh, some of whom are here at the University of Montana, I believe, um, of the, north, of the Flathead system. So here's uh, south, here's North Fork right here. Flathead Lake is down here. So some of the only places you can find, and this goes not just for the West Slopes, but for almost every cutthroat subspecies, the only places you can find really pure cutthroats anymore are in these very high headwater streams where there's a barrier waterfall that's preventing these rainbows from getting up there. 
and where the stream isn't big enough to have interested the fish and game department in stocking rainbows there. So some of the only places you'll find pure west slopes anymore are these white circles. The black circles represent hybrids. The white circles are the only remaining um, pure west slope cutthroat populations. And um, a lot of these hybrids are in fact probably many of them are less than 20% rainbow and if, and if you look at them you probably couldn't tell the difference between them and a west slope cutthroat. Um, and so there have been lawsuits and ongoing discussions about this, about whether these, these west slope cutthroats should be listed and it raises a really interesting problem because the primary threat to these west slope cutthroat is hybridization with these rainbow trout or with the rainbow hybrids. It, it, the, the primary threat is the spread of these rainbow genes. And at the same time, the only place you're going to find pure ones are often in populations that are so small that they're at serious risk of inbreeding depression. Almost certainly there were ecotypes of these West Slope cutthroats that would have been some, some genes or gene complexes that would have made them more suitable for these main stem areas rather than these headwater areas. And the only place you're going to find those genes anymore is, is mixed, mixed together with the rainbows. And it's in the hybrid fish. So uh, on the one hand, these rainbows and their hybrids are the primary threat to the West Slope cutthroat. And on the other hand, the only cure for inbreeding depression is to outbreed a little bit. And the only way you're ever going to find some of these genes again from the west slopes from the main stem are in these hybrid populations. So the, the hybrids and the rainbows are on the one hand the primary threat and then on the other hand they may be the, the salvation for these west slope cutthroats. And it raises these fascinating concepts about what, and, and conundrums about what we should do with these things. Um, so... Uh, this is just a little slide. That's one of that's probably a hybrid right there. Montana tries to encourage you to keep the non-native rainbows out of there and to um, let the cutthroats go, but of course it's much more difficult than that when you're dealing with hybrids. Who's to say which is which? We don't live in a black and white world anymore. Okay, so uh, I will wrap it up there, and then we can uh, go to questions after that. Yeah, still have time. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> no, they were in burlap sacks with parachutes. <laughs> yeah. so. Any other questions? Yeah. I see you've gotten a lot of pushback from industry biologists that are still seeing the soggy rainbows and just what it all naturally I'm just wondering, like, how have you, how have you dealt with those kind of endemic groups of people that still think it's absolutely the right thing? Yeah. So, first of all, surprisingly, I have had almost no, um, no one. I've been expecting to get, you know, attacked from the audience, and I have not. I haven't had much pushback at all. Bob Wiley, who is a Wyoming fish and game, a uh, game and fish, um, employee actually during the Green River poisoning he was a rookie biologist there and to this day continues to defend that as the right thing to do but I was just uh, and, would, and, and even says it would be the right thing to do today um, I've, I've actually developed a pretty cordial relationship with him I was just down in Wyoming the other week giving a talk and, and uh, he has a different point of view about the whole thing but uh, we've actually we get along quite well and have had some really interesting discussions about it um, but I do think What's that? If you get bored, you should visit the Chisuga River in South Carolina. I can get some exciting responses there. Yeah, so it does raise an interesting point, and I, and I think that's, um, you know, uh, there are people out there who may not only think it's the right thing to do, but their livelihood depends on it, right? So um, there's a whole sort of theory of economics called public choice theory, that, which basically states that these the bureaucracies are not the rational, objective actors that we would like to think them, uh, especially when we're creating laws for this purpose, um, that, that, um, that in fact bureaucracies tend to do what's in the best interest of the people who are involved in the bureaucracy. And so you get, of course, these, these fisheries agencies that derive almost all of their money from licenses, right? And the best way to sell licenses is to get people out there, as many people as possible catching fish, and you're going to get a lot more people just going out and catching fish if you can stock them right there and tell them where they're stocked and let them pull them right out of there. 
So uh, you do end up with that sort of incentive program that does create a whole sort of mentality. And I think actually within a lot of the agencies, there's a fair amount of um, uh, controversy between people within the agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, knowing what you now know about the cycle of making a management decision and then reversing it and um, seeing the outcome, what do you think is or should be the next step for fisheries? Uh, so, first of all, rainbow trout are here to stay. Uh, we're not going to get rid of them. The only places we're doing these restoration projects are in these very small, once again, headwater streams where we can create an artificial barrier. So I would say that there's not a lot. I mean, we can do some, and I, I support that. I, I like the idea of having native fish around from a personal values perspective. Um, but I, I look at it more as a sort of overall parable about how we approach natural resources management in general, which is... Uh, one of the things I was really struck by when I was working on this is that the people who were avidly putting rainbow trout everywhere 100 years ago, the, the similarity of the, their rhetoric to the rhetoric of the people today who are promoting native fish restoration is, is pretty amazing. And uh, they were sure they were doing the right, they were sure they were doing the right thing for the world. They were trying to do good things for, for America, uh, just as the people who are trying to restore these native fish see themselves as you know, often are pretty sure they're doing the right thing for the world. And so I guess one thing I would say is that I would encourage everybody, whether you're restoring native fish or not, to be pretty humble about it. Because who knows what they're going to be saying in 100 years about what we're doing today on behalf of native fish. Um, and second of all, part of the reason for that humility would be that you, the consequences are going to be are unpredictable. Whatever you do, not only are the consequences in that ecosystem going to be unpredictable, but even the consequences politically are going to be unpredictable as they learned after that Green River event. So I guess those are the two things I would take, to, to, I would, I, the, the lessons I would, I would hope come out of this was one, humility, and two, remember that whatever you do, you, you cannot determine what the outcome is going to be. Any other questions? Yeah. So you're talking about what happened in the U.S. and how you changed their policy measuring. Tell us a little bit about what's happened in the other countries or continents. If there's been a pushback now, to may go out and you're going to stay. Yeah, so I, I, um, I'd love to, uh, I, I think I need to do a research trip to New Zealand to go fishing to, to learn this. But uh, no, in South Africa, there was an attempt to, um, they started talking about getting rid of some of the rainbow trout because they've devastated the native fish there as well. And uh, there was a huge amount of pushback to the point that there was this movement to name rainbow trout an honorary indigenous fish. So, so, they would, so, so we could just stamp them native and, and uh, then, they, then we wouldn't have to remove them. Um, so there is, I think a lot of countries have a lot of the same controversies that we have, that, that rainbow trout are this ideal sport fish and you have this huge constituency built up around them and at the same time you have these people who are trying to hang on to the natives. Um, actually, one, of the, one, one area where, interestingly, uh, fishing for rainbow trout is taking off in a big way right now is around Beijing. So it's the same, it's the same cycle of massive industrialization, fear about what that industrialization and urbanization is going to do to the traditional values as a whole. What do we do? Get, a, get out fishing again and artificially stocking rainbow trout. So, yeah. Uh, you were saying... You're talking kind of about what the spread had to do with um, vertical grants and uh, materials and attitude. Are a lot of the international countries that have rainbow trout colonies in the United States of those countries? Do you find that as well? I was going to say, isn't, every, isn't everywhere a colony of France or England at some point? Um, no, I, I uh, well, now that you mention that, that's, that's interesting. There's Argentina and Chile, uh, and I don't know if Spain was into the acclimatizing movement. But I think it was. It was just, it was, I think it transcended just, it wasn't just localized to the French and the English and the Americans. It became just a uh, global movement to try to spread wildlife species all around. Any other questions? Yeah. So you've given two examples of how rainbow 
out outcompete species? Do they always do that? Do they always outcompete the natives? Well, they don't know. So first of all, like with the cutthroats, it's um, hybridization, right? And it's not always competition. Sometimes it's from spreading disease. Sometimes it's from actual predation, like it may be on those uh, mountain yellow-legged frogs. Um, and then some of the other effects are even more, you know, cascading than that. So one of the, actually, back to the Sierra Nevada, one of the points that Roland Knapps makes is, is, first of all, you know, we have a global amphibian decline going on right now thanks to this chytrid fungus. And the mountain yellow-legged frog may disappear entirely, not from the fish, but from the chytrid fungus. And he makes it very clear when he talks about his research that we're not just, this isn't just about the mountain yellow-legged frog. There are cascading effects. So these, these trout that are in these, these uh, lakes up there eat up all the aquatic invertebrates, which in the past would have hatched and flown out, and they would have provided this tremendous protein subsidy to the bats and to the gray-crowned rosy finches that live up there and raise their young up there and have a very limited window when there's not snow up there where they can actually raise their young. So you've got these cascading effects from this introduction of these rainbow trout that goes all the way to you know, the gray-crowned rosy finch and, and who knows how much further. Um, so it's not just about them competing or out-competing uh, native fish. Do you follow up with salmon farming? Yeah. Washington. Uh, I have followed that actually. Um, what in particular about it? The, the I mean. Yeah. So I think that virus hypothesis is quite fascinating. So so basically, you know, fish farming has um, a lot of issues associated with it. One of the most recent that they've determined is that they actually carry a virus that they were passing on to the wild fish, or they haven't determined this, but a hypothesis is that they were carrying a virus that they were passing on to the wild fish and that that was causing the decline of a lot of these wild fish. There's all sorts of other issues. There's the sea lice. There's, you know, the eutrophication of the estuaries. So certainly there's a lot of issues pertaining to fish farming that I, you know, I could try to catalog them. I think, does everyone know about the, um, you know, about aqua bounty and the, the, the so-called frankenfish? This is a whole other whole other issue, but but uh, soon probably uh, we will all be eating genetically modified salmon. It will be the first genetically modified animal ever introduced into the food chain in the United States. So this company in Massachusetts has created a genetically modified Atlantic salmon. They've taken a uh, I think it's a Chinook salmon gene and a promoter region from a pout, which is an ocean fish and inserted it into the DNA of the um, Atlantic salmon so that these, these Atlantic salmon grow twice as fast. They're going to they're gonna spawn in uh, Prince Edward Island and then actually raise them down in Panama. And so they've, they've been trying to get approval for this for a very long time. The FDA looks like it's really close to actually approving this. Um, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating issue, but among other things, the, they, they won't have to label it. So you won't know that you're buying a genetically modified salmon because the FDA says, no, we cannot and will not require them to label these, these fish. And even though, interestingly, the FDA does ban you from, uh, there was a company that put a GMO, they wrote GMO and then they put the circle with the line through it on it and put that on their package and the FDA banned them from doing that. You're not allowed to say that, you're not allowed to put that symbol up because that casts aspersions on gen genetically modified organisms. So if you look today, you could, they actually do that, but then there has to be a little asterisk, and then ask down below on the package, it'll say, you know, the FDA has determined that there's no risk from genetically modified organisms and stuff like that. So it's a really completely fascinating issue that's going on right now. And actually, the Alaska congressional delegation has been pushing really hard to try to block this thing. And then the Massachusetts congressional delegation has been trying to get it through and allow it. It's, it's fascinating. But I, I can't go into it all here. Any other questions? I think for the, uh, I'll throw in one more thing. For the purposes of, your, of the theme of wilderness and civilization, I'm assuming that whoever's in the, in the class here, <clears throat> you've, or, uh, you, you should read the William Cronin essay about wilderness if you haven't already, in which he sort of poses that, that this dualism between wilderness and, and uh, civilization that we have right now is actually problematic because it makes us care only about these pristine wildernesses and not actually think about the nature that may be 
uh, somewhat impacted by man. And I, I, I think there's an interesting analogy there that that could be extended to how we look at native versus non-native species. That we only care about these native fish and we don't care about the non-native fish. How, how, does that, how much of that is just a value system on our part? So I'll, I, I'll, I, I won't go further than that, but I think it's an interesting question. Okay.